Lots of people get scared when they fly, and they're sure the plane's going to crash. But in fact, it's one of the safest ways to travel. The odds of a plane crashing are only about one in a million, and obviously they're much less if you use an airline with a good safety record. It's very unlikely that your plane will crash, but even if it does. You'll probably be fine because ninety-five percent of people in plane crashes survive. If you sit at the back of the plane or over the wing near the exit, your chances get even better. So, if you're worried about getting on that plane, don't be, because you'll almost certainly survive the journey. You're more likely to have an accident in the car going to the airport. Your chances of having a road accident are one in eight thousand. So the safest way to travel is to take a train to the airport and then fly. More good news is that you have quite a good chance of living to be a hundred, especially if you don't worry too much. According to a recent report, in richer countries of the world, women who are twenty-five now have a one in four chance of reaching their one hundredth birthday. Men of twenty-five only have a one in six chance, not quite so good, but the chances are getting better all the time. So a girl born now has a one in three chance of living to a hundred, and a boy has a one in four chance. Of course, this depends on what country you're in. In some countries like Japan, the chances are even higher, and modern medicine may well make the chances higher still during your lifetime. So that's the good news. You probably won't die in a plane crash, and you, or at least your children, could live to be a hundred. But the bad news is, you almost certainly won't win the lottery. The chances of winning a big prize in the lottery are only about one in eighteen million, so that's extremely unlikely. Track five point one. He often arrives late to meetings and doesn't bring everything he needs. He's very disorganized. She always makes sensible decisions and she never does anything silly. She's very responsible. She often expresses negative opinions about things and other people. She's very critical. If he says he's going to do something, he always does it. He's very reliable. He doesn't think about how the things he says might affect other people. He's totally thoughtless. When you tell her your problems, she listens and tries to understand how you feel. She's sympathetic. He always wants to do better than everyone else. He's quite competitive. So when are you off? Monday of next week. Exciting. Sure is. This time next week, I'll be settling into my accommodation. So, I mean, what is it you'll be doing? From what I understand, well, you're going down there to keep your eye on some penguins. Is that it? <laughs> well, I suppose that's one way of looking at it. Yeah, but you know, what will you be doing on a daily basis? Well, I'm not entirely sure. But I think I'll be doing similar things every day. It's more or less a question of observing the penguins, counting them, taking photos, checking tags on some of them—that kind of thing. Okay, so just kind of 
standing around in the cold. <laughs> yes. Well, that's the downside of the job. That and the attacks. What? From polar bears? Um, at the South Pole? No, from penguins. You mean those sweet little birds attack you? Oh, yes. They're full of attitude, if you get too close. And will they be waiting for you when you get there? Well, of course, they know I'm coming. <sighs> Very funny. <laughs> so, there they are, Mr and Mrs Penguin, about to play happy families and... Yes, yeah, so by the time I arrive, the penguins will already have got into pairs and then by the middle of November... Each pair of penguins will have laid two eggs. You just watch them sit on their eggs? That must be really interesting. I'm sure they'll do something to keep me entertained. And then? Well, by the end of December, most of the chicks will have arrived and then after about three weeks, we put metal tags on them. Unless you get attacked by those nasty, aggressive parents. We have our methods of defence. Sounds scary. <laughs> OK, this is all very interesting, but, I mean, why? Why is it useful to know what these penguins do? It sounds like they kind of do the same old thing year after year. Nothing wrong with predictable... We scientists like that, but sometimes there can be changes. Like, maybe there are fewer chicks, or maybe the parents aren't able to feed the chicks and not as many survive. This can tell us a lot about what's happening in the Antarctic ecosystem. Like what exactly? Ah, I'm a scientist. I never jump to easy conclusions. <laughs> That's no fun. <laughs> but in a general sense, if there are changes in the number of penguins or changes in their behaviour, this can tell us that there has been a change in the climate of some sort. It's part of the evidence, the bigger picture, if you like. The work I'll be doing is just a small part in a big project that's been going on for some time. But because Antarctica is such an unspoilt environment, the changes that take place there can tell us a lot about what's happening on the rest of the planet. And you get to hang out with those cute little penguins. <laughs> yeah, well, it's just one big penguin party. Sounds pretty cool to me. Phil, we're closing. Nearly done. I'm just finishing this chapter. That's it. Done. See you tomorrow, then. What's wrong, Sam? The usual. Not enough money coming in. I need to do something to get more customers. Hmm. You could stay open longer? In the evenings. You could serve meals, I'd eat here. You practically live here anyway. Mm. <laughs> but it's an idea. Why not? No, it'd be a long day. You could do just Friday and Saturday to start with. I'd need to hire a cook, set up the kitchen properly. On the other hand, the extra money would be good. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, time to go. You ready, Phil? Yeah, coming. Bye, Sam. See you. That friend of yours, curly hair. Tessa. Tessa. Is she at college with you? Yeah. OK. Bye, Phil. <laughs> Bad day. The cafe. We're not making enough money. Come on, you're doing fine. Midweek, it's bound to be slow. I'm just worried. We've put all our money in this. I don't want to lose it. No, of course you don't. I can see that. 
Phil had an idea today. Yeah? Stay open Friday and Saturday evenings and serve food. Interesting. Yeah, of course, the trouble is we'd have to invest even more money. Money that we haven't got. Yes, but the good thing about it is it might be a way to get more business. Well, we'd need to put in a proper kitchen and that'd probably cost a fortune. And we'll have to hire someone to cook. But people do often ask if we're open in the evening, so there is a demand. I don't know. It's a big risk. I think it's a lovely idea. I know the perfect person to do the cooking. Who? Me. You? Seriously? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Promise I won't charge much. Yeah, of course, the trouble is we'd have to invest even more money. Yes, but the good thing about it is it might be a way to get more business. Die. Because I was travelling on my own, I decided to book a place on a coach tour. I thought it'd be fun and, you know, it would be easy to meet people and hang out with them in the evenings. Well, that was true. I made friends quite easily. But the tour itself... Well, I'd never do it like that again. Not ever. The problem is that people organising these tours try to fill every hour in the timetable. It's madness. Some days you have to be up, packed and ready to go by about 7.30am. And all the time they'd say, remember to do this, remember to be back at such and such a time. I mean, I was on holiday. This felt like being in the army. And they never allowed enough time to visit places. I remember visiting the incredible Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao. I was so excited because I studied architecture at university and wanted to stay all day at one of the most famous buildings in the world. Instead, I could hear the tour guide shouting behind me saying they would leave without me if I didn't get back on the coach. Before going to the next place, I decided to leave the tour. A woman I became friends with on the tour decided to join me. We went off on our own to Pamplona for the festival of San Fermin and spent a week there. After that, we continued travelling through Spain and then went to Portugal. It was much better to do things on our own. I didn't like the way the trip started, but by the end, it was a holiday with a new friend and great adventures. Bernie I worked in London over the winter months and then I got together with three other mates and we bought this van from a South African couple and we took off together to travel around Europe. We had a great time and there were just a couple of times when we sort of disagreed about what we'd do. The only thing is finding your way round these European cities and getting from one place to another. It's, well... It's a bit of a nightmare, really. I mean, we had guidebooks and maps and things, but often what you read about didn't really match reality. And there are just so many cars and so many people. Driving in Paris was really hard work. It was the first really big city we went to. On the second day there, we were driving down a road and I noticed all these people waving their arms at us. We were driving on the wrong side of the road. It was difficult to get used to that. We were only there for three days, and we didn't really know where to begin. We went to the Louvre to see the Mona Lisa and all that, but the paintings in this room, and there were all these people there with their phones taking a photo, without looking at the painting. And, actually, I couldn't really see it at all. Sometimes I'd see other tourists on some kind of tour, 
and it all looked nice and organized for them. So I guess you get to see a bit more that way, and you don't waste a whole lot of time trying to work things out. Next time I go away, I might try going on a tour of some kind. Last year we wanted to get away for a couple of weeks, so we decided to go trekking in the forests of Malaysia. We thought it would be cheaper to catch a train to the airport rather than go by taxi, but we were a bit upset to discover that the trains weren't running on time. We turned up at the check-in desk very late and just managed to catch our flight. The flight took 17 hours because we stopped over in Dubai for a couple of hours. By the time we got there, we were exhausted and not really in the mood for trekking. With us this week is Professor William Barnett, who is a specialist in languages that are dying. Professor Barnett, first of all, how many languages are there in the world? It must be more than the number of countries in the world. Oh, yes, many more. There are about 200 independent countries in the world, but we think there are around 7,000 different languages. 7,000? Yes, more or less. We don't know exactly, because there could be languages in areas like the Amazon that we haven't even discovered yet. In fact, we only have detailed knowledge of about 15% of the world's languages. And some of these are very widely spoken. Yes, that's right. Spanish, for example, is spoken by over 400 million people as a first language. English has close to 400 million native speakers. Portuguese and French have over 200 million. And the language with the most native speakers is Mandarin Chinese. It's spoken by a billion people. That's 14% of the world's population. So these languages are very big, and they're doing fine. In general, the languages that are widely spoken are increasing, while the languages that are spoken by smaller groups of people are declining. And is this something to worry about? It certainly is, yes. The number of languages spoken in the world is decreasing very, very quickly. Roughly one language every two weeks. That means that about 25 languages are lost every year. The situation is deteriorating because of globalization. People have more contact with each other and they start to speak English or Spanish or Chinese instead of their own language and their own language dies out. We think that over the next 100 years, about half of the world's spoken languages will die out. That means 3,500 languages will disappear completely in about 100 years. Yes, that's serious. Is there anything we can do about it? Well, one thing we can do is record the languages and find out more about them. Most small languages are spoken in certain regions of the world. We call these language hotspots. These are areas that have a lot of different languages, but each language is spoken by very few people. In one part of northern Australia, for example, there are around 135 tribal languages, but they're all in danger of disappearing. So we're focusing on areas like these, and we're writing the languages down and recording the voices of the last remaining speakers. So it may not be possible to revive the language, but at least we can try to preserve it for future generations. Professor Barnett, your job is to try to preserve endangered languages. Does it really matter if small languages die out and bigger languages take over? 
Why is it so important? Well, yes, it does matter. It matters very much. First of all, of course, it matters to the people who speak that language. Your language is part of your identity. Imagine if English died out and no one spoke it anymore. How would you feel? Okay, that's on a personal level. But what about for the wider world? Is it really important? Well, yes. If we lose a language, we're losing a part of human culture. There's all that knowledge that the language contains. It's like losing a painting or a building. Every language has its own way of seeing the world. What do you mean by that? Could you give an example? Well, one example, it's very well known, is a language called Inupiaq. It's spoken in northern Canada. Now, they have over a hundred different ways to describe sea ice. It's unique to that language. You couldn't translate that into English. And you can find examples like this in every language. Every language has a different way of looking at the world. OK, I can see that. But isn't it a good idea if everyone learns a global language, say English or Spanish or whatever? Then they can talk to other people. That's what language is for, surely. Yes, of course it's a good idea, but that's not the point. People often think you have to give up your own small language to learn a big language. And in the past, that often happened. But in fact, you don't have to do that. You can keep your language and learn the big language. In other words, teach children to be bilingual. So do you think it's really possible to stop languages from dying out? Yes, I think it is, if we want to enough. And it's already being done by people all around the world. One important thing we can do is change attitudes, especially in children. Make them feel proud of their own language, because unless children want to speak their own language, the language dies. And another thing is we can use technology. We can record people speaking the language, and we can create apps and games to help kids practice the language, for example. I think that's really important, because it gives a feeling that the language is something modern and fun, and something for young people to learn. So, if we leave late afternoon on Friday... I'll need to check with Becky, though. Do you think it'll be a problem? Well, it's asking quite a lot. She knows what to do, doesn't she? Yeah, but it means she'll have to look after the cafe for a day and a half by herself. Mm. Open up, set things up, deal with the cash, clean up, everything. Mm, true. That doesn't seem very fair. She has only just started. Well, Becky? Yeah? Do you mind if we ask you a favour? Of course not. What is it? Well, feel free to say no, but we, well, that is, Emma and I, we were hoping to get away on Friday afternoon for the weekend. Oh, lovely. Where? Paris, actually. Fantastic. So, we were wondering... Do you want me to look after the cafe? Would you? Of course. I can close up on Friday and sort everything out on Saturday. Just tell me what you need me to do. Are you sure? Of course. I'm happy to help. Thanks. That's really nice of you. Yes, thanks, Becky. It's just Sam hasn't had a weekend off for more than nine months. My pleasure. It's about time you two had a break together. <laughs> and I know how everything works now. It's no trouble at all. We really appreciate it. And if I don't know what to do, I can always ask Phil. <laughs> Can't I, Phil? What's that? You know all about the cafe. Do I? Don't worry, JK. Go back to your book. Yes, make us all famous. <laughs> I really am very grateful. 
it's not a problem. Hi there. Hi. Just returning your notes. Great. Great? Yes. Great what? I've just had a great idea for the story. Great. So, um, what is it you're writing? A science fiction novel. Oh, I'm quite into science fiction. Oh, really? You must tell me about it. I mean, your story, your ideas, one day. All right. Yeah, sure. One day. <laughs> Love to. <clears throat> so, my notes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thanks for the loan. No problem. Hey, I was thinking, you know this project, photographing bridges? We should probably make a start soon. I know somewhere great we could go. Good idea. When were you thinking? How about this weekend? Sorry, I can't. I've just told Sam I'd look after the cafe. No problem. Uh, how about the weekend after then? It's a date. Do you want a hand on Saturday? Here? Yeah, I could help clear tables and things like that. Great, thanks. That's really kind of you. I'm more than happy to help out. And if things are a bit slow... What? Phil can tell you all about his book. So, where did you go? We went camping in the Grand Canyon. It was amazing. A real experience. But before, we drove through the Mojave Desert. That's a big salt desert. Just salt for miles and miles. Wow, amazing. And we saw cowboys, didn't we, John? Uh, where was that? I don't know. Some town near there? It was like a cowboy show. They had a shootout. You mean like a gunfight? For show? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Then we stopped for something to eat. And we were really lucky because it was getting late and we had nowhere to stay. But the owner of the restaurant was really nice, wasn't he? He let us camp behind the restaurant. Yeah. The people were really friendly, weren't they? Yeah. It wasn't very comfortable, though. Why not? We couldn't blow up the airbed. It had a hole in it. So we slept on the ground. Really uncomfortable. Anyway, the next day we actually saw the Grand Canyon. Oh, that must be incredible. It is. It's breathtaking. I've never seen anything like it. Did you walk through it or what? No, we just drove round it. Round the South Rim. That's where the best views are. And we camped there too. We were lucky to find a place. It was peak season. Yeah. So anyway, then we watched the sunset over the Grand Canyon. Pretty amazing. And the next day, we got up at 4.45 and saw the sun rise. 4.45? Oh, it was worth it. It looks completely different at dawn. Um, what else did we do? We saw a condor. Oh, yes. They're really rare, apparently. Only 30 birds left. Really impressive birds. Mm, sounds great. And then we went on to Las Vegas. Wow, Las Vegas? Hope you didn't lose all your money. You're looking really tired. Yes, if I keep working 14-hour days, I'll burn out. Yes, you need to be careful. It's so hot in here. Yes, and there's not much fresh air. I feel like I'm going to pass out. OK, let's go outside. Have we got enough money for the holiday? 
I think so. I just need to work out the total cost. OK. Don't forget to include some money for taxi fares. Why don't you ask your family to help us move? I can't do that. Why not? I've fallen out with my brother and we're not speaking. Would you like some muesli for breakfast? I think we've run out of milk. Oh, have we? OK, I'll pop down to the shops and get some more. There have been a lot of strong applications for the job. True, but of all the applicants, Maria really stands out. Yes, she performed very well at the interview. Robbie wasn't a very nice child. No, he wasn't, but he's turned out to be a very nice young man. Yes, it's amazing how much he's changed. What are you going to do when we get to the resort? I'm going to lie by the swimming pool with a cold drink and just chill out. Mm, sounds like a good plan. So what exactly is a smart city? Well, it can be all kinds of different things, but there are two basic ideas. One is that the city uses technology to improve the quality of life of the local residents so that they can live more slowly and with less stress. And the second one is that the city itself reacts to problems rather like a living person would. Can you give me some examples? Yes, London is a good example. They have a system where they monitor cars driving into the centre and automatically charge the driver for the time the car spends there. So it cuts down traffic congestion and pollution, but it also means the driver doesn't have to stop and buy a ticket or look for money. So it saves time too. And to use the public transport system, you just need a single card and you can go everywhere with it. So you don't need to spend time queuing for tickets. Or in Dublin, in Ireland, they have a system which monitors traffic congestion. So drivers can avoid streets with traffic jams. And it also tells drivers where they can find a free parking space. Apparently, 30% of traffic congestion in most cities is caused by people looking for parking spaces. So that's a huge saving in time and money. So the main point of smart cities is to improve the environment? Yes, but it can take many different forms. It's not just about traffic congestion. For example, there's a new city in the UAE called Mastar. It's in the middle of the desert and the whole city is powered by solar panels and public transport is electric. So it's a 100% sustainable city. It uses zero energy and there's no air pollution. Or there's another new city in Korea called Sondo, which is planned around a central park. So, from all the residential areas, there's a 15-minute walk across the park to get to work. And people can also use the park in their lunch break. I read a report recently that said that green spaces in cities really improve people's mental health. So, the park sounds like a great idea. So, it's not just about the environment, it's about urban development in general. Yes, exactly. And do you think this is how cities will be in the future? Oh, I'm quite sure of it. The technology is there already. We're all connected now on the internet, so the next step is to connect the people with the city. And it's already happening very quickly. Daniela I think it's a good idea to make cities better places to live because a lot of cities have developed on a kind of American model. In other words, the city centre is taken over by big companies, so there are hardly any shops or people living there. 
Instead, most people live in big high-rise blocks around the edge of the city, and they go to big shopping centers in their cars. So, it's really good to change that balance and make the city center a place for people to live. I live in Munich in Germany, and in a number of ways, I think it is a smart city because it's been developed to suit the people who live there. The center's a pedestrian zone, closed off to traffic, people cycle everywhere, and there are plenty of good cafes and parks and places to sit outside. So you can wander through the city and take your time. And it's nice and quiet. Also, there's a very good public transport system, so people don't need their cars as much. Richard. I don't think you have to design a city to make it a nice place to live. I live in Bangkok, the capital of Thailand, and it certainly isn't a planned city. It's just grown naturally. In some ways, it's quite a chaotic city. There are cars everywhere, lots of traffic jams, a lot of noise, and there are very few green spaces where you can sit. So if you want a bit of peace and quiet, forget it. But I love living here. It's so full of life and there are people everywhere. In the street where I live, there are lots of ordinary apartments, plus a few hotels. There's a very good vegetable market. There are quite a few restaurants. And there are people selling things in the street. So there's everything you need, plus lots of traffic, of course. So it certainly isn't a smart city, but it's very exciting to live here. Antonia. As with most things in life, I started small. Not long after I bought this flat, I suddenly decided that the cabinet in the kitchen was ugly. It was modern and beige, oh, and I couldn't stand it. A few days later, I found this absolutely gorgeous old wooden cabinet from the 1920s in a second-hand shop. I pulled out the original cabinet and replaced it with the one I found. And then everything looked wrong. I also discovered that the original fireplace and chimney were covered up and underneath there were these lovely old red bricks. The cover had to come off. Then the paintwork looked just awful and uh, <laughs> so it went on. Now I've got a lovely homestyle kitchen. I'm really satisfied with that. But I wasn't at all satisfied with the layout of the dining room and the sitting room. They were two very small rooms and I thought, just imagine... Knock down the dividing wall and I could have this lovely open living space. So one weekend I got busy and the wall came down. I've still got some work to do there. Then there's the bedroom. I haven't had time yet. And the bathroom needs major attention. Okay, <laughs> I admit it, I'm addicted to renovation. I can't help myself. I love doing these things myself. Getting it done by a professional isn't nearly as much fun. But hey, there are lots of worse things to be addicted to. And my flat's looking better and better with every day. Rob. You see, under our house, there was a kind of cellar and a garage, and there was also a small passage between the two. They're the kind of places where we keep things we no longer use. But I suddenly had this great idea. What if I knocked down a few walls and made the cellar and the garage one big area, a kind of 
basement that the kids could use as their space. I got a friend of mine who's an engineer to have a look and make sure it was possible. I mean, I didn't want the house to fall down. And he said, sure, no problem. And I've helped a lot of friends and family do this kind of thing in the past. Like, I've got a pretty good idea about what to do. So, I had this great weekend where I knocked down the walls. I loved that. You can really see the potential immediately. Problem is, once you knock something down, you sort of have to build a few things in their place, so it doesn't look like a work site. But, well, things have been busy at work, and at weekends, there are lots of things to do with the kids. Football matches and stuff like that. I mean, I fully intend to finish it all off. That's what I keep promising my wife. But she thinks that I've got a commitment problem. You know, that I'm not committed to finishing off the renovation. Maybe she's right. But these things aren't as easy as they look. I suppose I could have it done by a professional, but that's expensive. I just say that it's a work in progress. It'll get there. Eventually. This is a really good angle. Let's have a look. Oh, that's great. We can use that one in the competition. What competition? Didn't you get the email? I don't think so. I don't remember. It's called London Architecture in Photographs. It's a free competition. The college said they'll enter our bridge photos. I'm not sure I can be bothered. I don't really see the point. Well, the first prize is £500. OK, that's different. Let's take some more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can... Completely forgot the time I've got to go. I'm meeting Tom at 12. Why don't you call him and tell him you'll be late? I can't. We're meeting the estate agent. Estate agent? Yeah, we're looking at flats. You know, we want to rent a flat for after we're married. All oh, right. You better go then. Yeah, see you later. Bye. Good luck. Hi, sorry I'm late. I was taking photos with Tessa. That's OK. This is Katie West. She's from the estate agent. Hi, lovely to meet you. I'm Becky. Very nice to meet you, Becky. Good. So, I'll show you the first flat. We have had a lot of interest in this already. As you can see, it's in a great location, right by the shops, close to the station. Follow me. Great. Here it is. It's a lovely flat for two people. Not too big, just right for the two of you. Two rooms and a kitchen? Yes, two rooms, a kitchen and a bathroom. OK. So, here's the living room. Quite a good-sized room. And a nice view of the street. And here's the second room. It's a bit smaller, but it's perfect as a bedroom. Nice and quiet in here. Cosy. And here's the kitchen. Quite practical and, uh, yeah, has everything you need for a kitchen. It's very convenient. I'll leave you to it. Well... I can see why the price is low. It's tiny. Yeah, and too noisy. Right on the main road. Yeah, and it smells all damp. Horrible. It's awful. Oh, dear. Well, let's see what the next one's like. So, what do you think? Yeah, um, it's nice. It's lovely. But maybe not quite what we're looking for. This one's just come on the market. I think you might like this one better. Have a look round, see what you think. Thank you. 
This is a lovely flat. But can we afford it? Well, with my promotion, I have got a bit more money now. It really is lovely. Look, this could be a kind of sitting area by the window. Yeah, that's a great idea. And we could have some plants and some bookshelves or a big lamp. Mm, that would work well. And this would make a great dining area. We could have a table and some interesting lights. Yeah, and I can imagine a big TV right here. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you think? Yeah, it's a brilliant flat. Um, well, we have had one other inquiry this morning, but if you're definitely interested... We'll think about it. Can I let you know this afternoon? Of course. No problem. I thought this could be a kind of separate living area by the window. OK. Yeah, that's a great idea. And we could have plants and bookshelves and things there. Or a big lamp. Mmm, that would work well. And this would make a good dining area. We could have a table here or something and some interesting lights. Fantastic. Kamal. I think it's a really bad idea. What do we need a shopping centre for? I mean, we've got a local shop and that sells quite a good range of things. Anything you need in an emergency. There's a supermarket only about five kilometres away and it's so easy to get there by bus. A shopping centre's going to ruin this neighbourhood. Why can't they create a nice green living space instead? Susie. I think it's great. It's going to be really convenient to have plenty of shops nearby. If I have to do anything like, I don't know, go to the supermarket or get my hair cut or something, I have to go into town and it takes such a long time in the traffic. Can't wait for them to build the shopping centre. It's exciting. Carol. Well, I am looking forward to having a range of shops nearby. There aren't enough in this part of town, but I know this will change the neighbourhood. It'll make it a lot busier and noisier, and there'll be so much traffic. But I suppose that's the price you pay for convenience. Duncan. The idea of a shopping centre doesn't particularly bother me. But I guess there'll be a large number of the same old shops. Very boring. Everything's part of a chain these days. I wouldn't mind so much if they had a few more interesting shops in the centre. You know, something like an independent music shop or something. But I know that won't happen. Miles. Well, it's about time. That local shop we have is useless. They never order enough of anything, and they're always running out of milk and bread and basic things like that. But a new supermarket and lots of shops, that's progress. It'll be great. Marion. It's going to completely change the community. I mean, a number of families live in this part of town and we have young children. Apart from the traffic, we'll have so many people passing through our streets. I really don't know how safe it'll be to live here. It's just... Well, I'm thinking about my children... I want them to be safe. Welcome to this week's edition of The Money Pool. Today we've invited personal finance expert Mia Radkin on the show to answer questions about your money. Hi Mia. Hello Michael. And welcome. Thank you. The number is 0800 
666-961. Give us a call now with your personal finance question, but I believe we already have Jacob on the line. Hello. Hello, Jacob. So, Jacob, you've got a question about savings goals. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. My income's OK, and I more or less manage to keep up with my bills and everything, but I never seem to get much ahead. I'd like to start saving for a home, but it feels like a bit of a waste of time. OK, Jacob. I noticed that you said you more or less keep up with your bills. What's your biggest monthly bill? Well... Probably my credit card. Hmm, thought so. But I always pay at least the minimum amount each month, sometimes a bit more. Do you mind my asking, Jacob, how much do you owe on your credit card? Well, it's about £15,000. And I imagine you're paying about 18% interest? Yeah, about that. OK, here's what I'd suggest you do, Jacob. Find another credit card provider who will let you transfer your balance to them and pay a very low interest rate. If you transfer your balance, you'll probably pay as little as 3% and then start paying off that debt as fast as you can. The first step to serious saving is to get out of debt. Right. And then I'd like you to do something else. Get a pair of scissors and cut up your new credit card. You mean get rid of it? That's right. So you don't use it. But if I did that, I wouldn't be able to afford things like holidays and going out for dinner. Well, no. Looks like you might have to make some lifestyle changes too, Jacob. But the first step is to manage your debt sensibly, OK? Yeah, good point. Thanks. Thank you for calling us, Jacob. So, now we go to Sophie. Sounds like she's got money to spare. Is that right, Sophie? Hello? Yes, hello, Sophie. You're on air now. Oh, right. How can I help, Sophie? Well, I just want a bit of advice, really. I've been putting aside money for the past five years or so. I've got savings of just over £17,500 in a long-term interest account, and it's earning about 2.5%. But I worry if this is the best place for it. Should I be investing the money somewhere else? So, tell me, Sophie, have you got debts? Mm, not really. Well, just my student loan, but money gets taken out of my salary for that. It's automatic. Sort of like paying tax. But you're still paying interest on that loan. If I were you, I'd use the money to pay off your student loan. But if I did that, I wouldn't have any spare money, you know, for an emergency. £17,500? What kind of emergency are you expecting? Yes, I see. Look, it sounds to me like you're a pretty sensible person when it comes to money. And I always say, before you worry about investment, free yourself from debt. Actually, I think my student loan is now about £16,000. If I pay it off, I'll be debt free. And that's a very good thing to be. <laughs> <laughs> If I save a little every month, I'll be able to afford a new car soon. If I had one pound for every time I've heard that, I'd be a millionaire. If I saved 50 pounds every month, I'd have enough for a new computer by the end of the year. If I were you, 
I wouldn't borrow so much money. If I see her tomorrow, I'm going to tell her my news. If you finished your test and you're waiting to leave, you should come to my desk. If you finished your test and you're waiting to leave, please come to my desk. If I weren't feeling so tired, I might go for a run. Well, I think I would have looked inside the wallet and then I would have emailed the person whose name appeared on the business cards. I would have told him or her that someone had found the wallet and that we were keeping it for them. Or possibly, if I'd been an employee at the hotel, I would have told the manager what had happened and the hotel would have done the right thing. I mean, that's the hotel's responsibility, isn't it? I certainly wouldn't have taken the money. It didn't belong to me. Obviously, the person should have been more careful, but taking the money would have been theft, so it certainly wouldn't have been right to take the money. Well, I think I would have taken the wallet and would have looked inside it. And then I would have thought about it. Maybe I would have taken some of the money for myself. I would have been tempted, certainly, especially if I was in a low-paid job. Maybe I'm just not a very honest person, but I would have thought, well, it wasn't my mistake, the person shouldn't have lost it. Also, the owner of the wallet would get his or her wallet back because of me, so I think it would have been reasonable for me to earn a little money from that too. Actually, I wouldn't have accepted the wallet in the first place. Why should I? I would have told the person who came in with the wallet to take it to the police, or maybe to deal with it on their own. If it wasn't actually found in the hotel, I don't think it would really have been my responsibility. Also, I'd never take something a stranger tried to give me you never know what might be in it or what could happen. It could be something they've stolen. Or it could have been some kind of scam. Someone trying to distract me while they stole something from me. Did you hear about the trial of that company director? Oh, you mean the one who was accused of bribery? I knew he'd been arrested. What happened? It was incredible. He appeared in court yesterday and five witnesses all gave evidence. They all said he had asked them for bribes. Wow. So what was the verdict? Was he found guilty? No. The jury said he was not guilty. Hmm. What did the judge say? Nothing. She didn't sentence him. She let him go free. Hmm. That's a bit odd, isn't it? The estate agent just called me back. And? We didn't get the flat. We just missed it. Someone came in and signed a contract about an hour ago. Oh, no. So we just missed it? Afraid so. That's really disappointing. I know. I did try ringing earlier, but kept getting the estate agent's voicemail. Oh, don't worry. It's not your fault. We are just unlucky. Yeah. I'll go and see what else they've got a bit later on. Good idea. I'm sure there'll be plenty of other places. We'll find somewhere. Of course we will. Bye. I'm uh, just popping out for an hour. Sure. What's up? Oh, flat hunting, you know. Yeah, it's never easy. Don't give up hope. You'll find something. Yeah. You look very smart. What's the big occasion? The bank. Oh, scary. Well, I want to make improvements to the kitchen. Yeah, that's going to be expensive. Yeah, we need a new cooker, bigger fridge, that sort of thing. 
Well, the evening meals have been popular, though, haven't they? Yeah, better than I thought. Emma's a great cook. Well, I always knew that. And it's good to make changes. Well, I hope the bank agrees. I'm sure they will. Hmm. Good luck. Thanks. I've got my performance review with my boss tomorrow. You've had a good year. I'm sure it'll be fine. I'd like a pay rise, but I don't think I'll get it. Well, you never know. It's our final game of the season tomorrow, and two members of our team can't play. We're bound to lose. It might work out fine. But there are two best players. Never give up hope. Sam. Hi, right, Tom. Hi, Sam. You escaped for a few minutes. Oh, I've just been to the bank. Oh, yeah. See about a loan to improve the kitchen. All right. How did it go? I don't really know. You know banks. They never say much at first. Then they say no. Yeah. Same thing happened to me. At the bank? No, the estate agents. They weren't very helpful. Yeah, right. Finding somewhere to live, it's really difficult, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Sorry, I've got to get back to work. Are you going this way? Yeah. Um, Becky said it had been hard work. Yeah, we missed out on the perfect flat. Mm, I know the feeling. Oh? It was just like that when I was looking for the cafe. But you found a good place. The cafe's great and it's in a good location. In the end, someone else got it first and they changed their mind. All oh, right. So you never know. Well, I've learned one thing. What's that? The next time we find the perfect place, I'll say yes straight away. <laughs> Hello Tom, it's Katie here from Barker's Estate Agents. Thanks for coming in earlier. Something interesting's just come up. Can you call me back on 249-456? Hi Katie. Katie, hi, hi, it's Tom Gibson here. Yes, I just got your voicemail. Did you see that reality crime show on TV last night? The one about the young woman using the old man's credit card to buy things for herself? Yeah, it made me really angry. It was like a lesson on how to commit a crime. You know, get friendly with the old person, get them to trust you, and then offer to get a credit card for them. I mean, if you show people this stuff, then other people will just copy what that young woman did. Do you think so? But it showed you'll get arrested in the end. That's only because the old man's niece happened to see the credit card statement and notice all those purchases for women's clothing. Actually, what amazed me about that is the way the niece spoke to the young woman first. If it had been me, I'd have gone straight to the police. But I still think the whole programme was sort of saying it's OK to do this. Like the interview with the young woman. She had all this makeup on, a beautiful dress. It was like she was some kind of star or something. I couldn't believe it. That's true. And they hardly spoke to the old man. Poor thing. He looked terrified by the whole experience of being filmed. Exactly. And he really didn't want to be on TV. I thought the presenter was really pushy with him. She kept repeating the same question. But didn't you realise? Didn't you realise? But he must have agreed to it all. They usually have to sign something for those TV programmes. I bet it was the niece who talked him into it. She seemed to enjoy being on TV too. That's a problem with programmes like that. All these boring, ordinary people turn into famous people. Well, for about five minutes anyway. But I guess you could say that the programme was like a warning to people. You know, telling them to be careful who they trust with their money, credit cards, things like that. Yeah, hardly. But the presenter did say that at the very end. Yeah, I suppose so. 
But the saddest thing of all, the old man still thought the young woman was a nice girl. And the presenter did point out that many thieves are very charming. But doesn't everyone know that? Obviously not. If I were you, I wouldn't watch that show anymore. Well, I'm not sure I want electronics just stuck on my skin. I bet it's no different from putting on a plaster when you cut yourself. But plasters don't have electronics in them. It wouldn't worry me. There are other things to worry about. Like what? Well, what was it I was reading about the other day? Yeah, there's this laboratory where they're growing meat. Synthetic meat. I find that kind of scary. Oh, that. Yeah, there was that scientist who made his own hamburger and ate it online. Yuck. Actually, I think that's a great idea. Grow your own meat. Very cool. But it's not natural. Yes, it is. It's just not grown on a cow, that's all. But all these tiny pieces of meat that they have to push together just to make one burger. Nothing wrong with that. And the end result is something that costs 250 thousand euros to make. I mean, these scientists who are sort of like Dr. Frankenstein, how can they justify that? Well, but they're bound to find cheaper ways to grow the meat. And what you may not realise is that it's much better for the environment. How come? I was reading about it. And to produce just 15 grams of meat, that's one five, Cows need about a hundred grams of vegetables. I mean, that's a really, really inefficient use of energy. I'm sure it takes a lot of energy to make meat grow in the laboratory. Not nearly as much. And what I didn't know was that about 30% of the Earth's surface is covered with crops that we grow just to feed animals for meat. Yeah, I know that. And so, if we can grow meat, we could use some of that land to grow crops for people. Well, yeah, fair point. But what amazes me is that you can't see the obvious answer. Go vegan. Vegan? Why would I do that? I like meat. Well, I don't think you'd like meat that a scientist has made in a laboratory. There's no fat or blood in it, which means it would taste different. All right, but why vegan? What's wrong with cheese? Dairy cows. They produce tons of carbon dioxide and methane, which are all harmful gases. Very bad for global warming. Hmm, I suppose that's true. But tell me one thing. What? When did you last catch the bus to work? Well, it was, I don't know, a couple of months ago? More like a year ago. You drive every day. Well, Toby, what I find strange is that if you're worried about the climate crisis, well, I think there are more ways of helping out than eating meat that a scientist has put together in a laboratory. Yeah, but the bus service is really inconvenient. Sure it is. Well, you can stick what you like on your skin. I'm going to enjoy my synthetic burger. There are so many scary stories these days about food. It makes it difficult to know what's safe to eat. I don't pay attention to any of it. Not even if it's based on research. Well, it's easy to claim that something is the result of research. But how do you know how reliable the research is? Anyway, it might just be made up. So much of what you see online is false information. Or you can't trust where it came from. Or it could be a hoax. 
Like that story that was going around about man-eating bananas. Man-eating bananas? Yes, it was a few years ago. People in the USA started receiving emails warning them not to eat bananas from Central America because they could contain flesh-eating bacteria and telling them to pass the email on. And people believed that? Well, some did. The emails were supposed to be from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which really exists. Maybe they suspected it was a hoax, but they weren't sure. So they stopped buying bananas just in case, and they sent the email on to other people. So anyway, banana sales crashed. Just because of an email? Well... It sounded real. It said the bananas were infected with a bacterium called necrotizing fasciitis and it was spread to bananas by monkeys. And obviously most people had no idea what necrotizing fasciitis was, but it sounded dangerous. Necrotizing fasciitis? Does that even exist? Yes, it's a real disease, but you can't get it from bananas and it doesn't really eat your flesh. It might just cause an infection if you have an open wound or something. It can be quite serious, but it's very rare. It's amazing people believed it was true without checking. Yes, They even started discussing it on TV chat shows with doctors appearing and everything. And eventually, people came to the conclusion it was just a hoax. But then the same story appeared in South Africa a few years later. And the same thing happened? I know, right? They said that monkeys in South Africa were dying after eating bananas. It sounded like a reasonable story, so I guess people just assumed it was true. So everyone stopped eating bananas from South Africa for a while until they realised it was all a hoax. OK, well, if I get an email about man-eating bananas, I'll know it's a hoax. Yes, and don't pass it on to me. What's all this about? What's the big secret? We've got to be somewhere, that's all. But where? Ah, it's a surprise. Mm, I'm not sure I like surprises. It'll be fine. I've no idea where we are. I've never seen this street before. Just wait and see. Where on earth are we going? Wait and see. Hang on, I know where we are. Do you? Yeah. Is there another flat available around here? Follow me. But Tom, this is the same flat. Welcome to our new home. Really? Step right this way. What do you think? But didn't you say yesterday that we'd missed out? And we did. So what happened? The estate agent called me back. The other people changed their mind. Really? So it's ours if we want it? Um, actually, it is ours. <laughs> what? I paid a deposit this afternoon. But Tom, I thought we were going to talk about it first. Oh. Right, I sort of thought we had. Well, I suppose, in a way. And you were so disappointed when we missed out. Yes. Yes, I was. And I didn't want to miss out this time. But you could have said something. Sorry. I wanted it to be a surprise. Well... Next time, make sure you ask me. Well? It's a lovely surprise. (laughs) 
You're not too annoyed? No. In fact, not at all. You did say it was the perfect flat. And it is. I love this space and the view and the kitchen is so well designed. Did you guess? In the car? Yeah. Well, I thought you were taking me to see a flat. But not this one. No, of course not. I thought about it a bit yesterday. You know, the different route. <laughs> I do love it. I can't wait to move in. We have to sign the lease first. Yes, of course. And there's another document that we have to sign beforehand. What's that? Our marriage license, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> I had really bad headaches, so I decided to go to a homeopathic doctor. You know, they give you these little white tablets which have a tiny amount of something which is actually poisonous. And I remember on my first visit, he spent an hour asking me questions to find out as much as he could about me before he looked at what was wrong with me. He said the idea was to treat the whole person, not just the disease. I thought this was really good. My normal doctor is always in a hurry, and you're lucky if he gives you more than 10 minutes. A friend of mine had a very bad cough which wouldn't go away, so he tried a treatment called radionics. The person treating you takes something that belongs to you, like a piece of clothing or something, and then turns some dials on this box. It looks a bit like a radio, actually. And then they decide what's wrong with you. What a load of rubbish. I don't know how people can believe things like that. I had really bad pains in my knee, I tried all kinds of drugs and I even went to hospital, but nothing worked. I could walk, but I couldn't run or do sport. Then a friend recommended acupuncture. It's where they put needles into particular points or places on your body. I was a bit doubtful at first, but I tried it and the doctor put needles all round my knees. Since then, I haven't had any problems at all. I can even go skiing again. I've no idea how it works, but it certainly worked for me. A friend of mine tried several times to give up smoking, but she always started again. Then someone recommended a doctor who used hypnosis. She told me about it. It was really interesting. She sat in a comfortable chair and he hypnotised her. He just counted to 20 and she fell into a deep sleep and when she woke up, she didn't want to smoke anymore. Obviously, she doesn't remember what he said when she was under hypnosis, but I guess he must have told her that she didn't need to smoke. That was three months ago and she still doesn't want to smoke. The story of Dan Cooper raises more questions than it answers. Today we talk to Bob Fernandez, who has written a new book on the disappearance. Bob, there are a lot of mysterious elements to this story. First of all, how did he get on the plane with a briefcase full of dynamite? Well, that's easy to answer. Remember, this was 1971, and they didn't have airport security the way they do now. Security checks came in much later, so there's no mystery there. But of course, we have no idea whether he was really carrying dynamite. It might have just looked like dynamite. And who was he? Do we know that? We know that Dan Cooper wasn't his real name. That was easy to check, and there were no Dan Coopers who'd gone missing. But who was he? No one knows. He knew a lot about planes, and he also knew how to parachute. So he may have been a retired pilot, or he may have had some job to do with aircraft. Certainly someone with inside knowledge. 
and he also knew the area where he jumped. One interesting thing is that several people claimed later that he survived and they knew him. For example, in 1982, a woman claimed that he was her husband who'd just died. She said she'd found him in 1972 hiding in her garden with a broken foot, and they'd fallen in love and got married. This was her story, but there was no way they could prove it. I suppose the big question is, could he have survived the jump? He jumped into a storm at night holding bags of dollar bills, and he had to open a parachute. Is that possible? Well, we know that what he did was possible because not long afterwards, a stuntman repeated exactly what he'd done successfully. And quite a few things suggest that he did land safely. For example, they never found either the body or the parachute. And if you think the parachute was bright yellow and red, and they searched everywhere, that's quite something you'd be able to see it from the air. So that suggests he might have landed and then hidden the parachute. One of the few clues we have is that in 1980, a boy found some of the money buried in a riverbank. Yes, this was one bag of Dan Cooper's money, so people thought that he might have drowned in the river. But they searched the river pretty carefully and they didn't find anything. And there are other explanations. For example, he might have lost some of the money when he landed and gone off with the rest. Or he might even have thrown it away to confuse the police and then crossed the border into Mexico. No one knows. The one thing we do know is the police never found him. Louise Ever since I was a child, I've been fascinated with Africa. The thing that has always interested me most is the incredible wildlife. Lions, elephants, gazelles, rhinos. I mean, there are just so many amazing animals. After I started work, I saved up money for a holiday in South Africa and went on a safari. It was Fantastic. But it just wasn't enough. I remember thinking at the time, oh, I wish I could stay longer. I came back home and went back to work. I'd heard about conservation projects and the fact they often need volunteers. You know, people who go and help researchers, that kind of thing. So I started saving because I thought it would be great to go and volunteer for a year. It took me another six years to save up enough money to support myself for that year, but I managed to do it. My workplace lets people take leave without pay for up to six months. I should probably have done that, but I wanted to go for a full year, so I had to resign from my job. Terry I'm a computer technician and I used to work in the IT support department for a bank. I was there for about three years, and in my final year, I really began to hate the atmosphere in the team I worked in. I thought my boss wasn't a very good manager, and I felt I could have done a better job. If only I'd applied for his job when it became free. I thought I wasn't qualified enough but I would have done a much better job than he did. Anyway, I realised there were a lot of people living in my area who needed help with computers and IT problems. And I also worked out that they'd prefer the technician to go to them at home rather than have to take it to a workshop to be fixed. So I decided to set up my own business and become my own boss. I gave up my job at the bank. Oh, hi, Tessa. I was just looking for you. Uh, can I have a quick word? It's something important. Let's go to my office. Yeah? I'll wait for you. Don't look so worried. It's good news. 
we've had the results of the photo competition. Oh, yeah. And you've won first prize. £500. Congratulations. What? <laughs> yes. Well done. We're very pleased for you. And it's excellent news for the college, too. I don't know what to say. I wasn't expecting this. No, you deserve to win. I don't think you realise quite how good you are. Well, no. <laughs> I mean, yes, thank you. So, two things to celebrate today. First, Becky and Tom, you found your dream flat. Thanks to Tom making a quick decision. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we almost didn't get it. <laughs> we hope you'll both be very happy in it. So, what's the second thing? Well, the second reason to celebrate, as you've seen, business is going well. Mm. The meals have been a real success, thanks to Emma and your wonderful cooking. Yay! <laughs> and to Phil, it was your idea to open late and serve meals. Brilliant. Yay! <laughs> So now let's cut this cake. Hold on. There's something else we have to celebrate. Hold on. There's something else we have to celebrate. You know our photo competition, our photos of the bridges? Well, Tessa won first prize. <gasps> That's brilliant. Yeah, great news. <laughs> when did you find out? I only heard this morning. I couldn't believe it. I was so surprised. First prize. I still can't get over it. <laughs> well done, Tessa. No, I knew you'd win. You take such great photos. Mm -hmm. So that's three things to celebrate. The flat, the cafe and Tessa's prize. And you looking happy for a change. That's a fourth thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now can we eat this cake? Oh, hang on a minute before we start. I've got something to say. I know you won't believe this, but I finished my novel. That's oh. great, Phil. I sent it off today, so the coffee's on me. <laughs> you can't afford to buy us coffee. You're not J.K. Rowling yet. You never know. Maybe one day. Well done, Phil. Such a good story and so original. Thanks, Tessa. I reckon you'll get some good news soon. I hope so. But you won't forget us when you're rich and famous. <laughs> How could I? <laughs> right, uh, I'm gonna cut this cake. Just a minute before we start, one more thing. We've decided on a date for the wedding. Oh! oh finally. <laughs> Saturday the 19th of June. And you're all invited. Yay! <laughs> okay, any more good news? <laughs> no? Right, now I'm definitely going to cut this cake. I'd like to get your opinion on something. Sure. The state piano competition next year. Do you think I'm up to it? You could be. Meaning? You'll have to do a lot of work if you want to do well in the competition. I thought so. But how much work? Well, I guess your decision is about more than just a competition. You need to think about what you want to do with your life. Well, whatever I do with my life, like my job, I'd really like it to involve playing the piano. How much do you want it? Well, I... It's kind of a dream for me. Kind of? Well, no. I really do want it. Okay. Well, you have about three choices. You become a piano teacher like me, or you could become a session musician playing piano for bands, orchestras, but if you do that, you'd have to play all kinds of music, not just classical. And the third option is the difficult one, becoming a concert pianist. That means you're aiming really high. Do you think it's aiming too high? 
Not necessarily. You've got talent, no doubt about that. But it's a commitment, a major commitment. Hours and hours of practice, and you have to cope with a lot of pressure. And if you want to go for the state competition, you're more or less saying you want to become a concert pianist. I understand. So, what would it involve? You're planning on going to university next year, right? Yeah. Well, for starters, don't. Really? Wait a year. Devote yourself to the piano. You'll need that level of preparation. Maybe get a part-time job for money, but your main focus should be the piano. I'll need to think about it. Ask my parents. Good idea. And just be aware of the fact that, well, it's a long journey. What do you mean? Well, there'll be times when your ultimate goal seems a long way off, and it feels like you're going nowhere. <laughs> sure. Doesn't sound like a problem now, but when it's happening. So what do you do? Well, you need to have a lot of mini goals along the way. I mean, keep your eye on the main goal, but set objectives that are achievable as you work your way towards it. Anything else? Discipline, self-control. No matter how good you are, you'll get negative feedback. You can't let it get to you. You must stay positive, even if you know you could have done better. If you give in to negativity, it'll defeat you. Oh, you make it sound like some kind of psychological game. To a large extent, it is. Okay, but tell me, did you ever think about becoming a concert pianist? Sort of, but I never really tried. Sometimes I wish I had. Why didn't you? Stage fright, mostly. I'm terrified of performing in front of large groups. Now that I think about it. It's something I might have overcome. Learn to manage. You play so beautifully. Thank you. You could have been a big star. <laughs> I'm not so sure about that. I'm happy being a teacher, trying to make other people stars. <laughs>